Oops, excuse me, it's the wrong slide. Okay, well, thank you very much for the welcome and for, the, uh, for coming this morning early to hear the talk. I hope you find it interesting. Um, and thanks to Peter and the organizers for that very generous introduction. So my name's Mark Harmon, and um, this talk is actually the talk of, of, of the work of the whole of the Sapiens team at, um, at Facebook. This is the team here. Actually, I don't know, is that a bit bleached out? Can you see that okay? This is such a fantastic view out there that, <laughs> with the sun coming in still. So anyway, so this is the, the Sapiens team at Facebook, and the work I'm going to be presenting today is the work of, of the whole team. And actually, our story starts, or at least my personal story, starts a, a, a little bit earlier. Um, as Peter says, I'm not really a programming languages researcher. When I was at school, I kind of thought I was a mathematician, but then I was very quickly disabused of that notion, and I fell a little bit, and I fell in with a very bad crowd at school. You know, People are into all sorts of very suspicious things like programming. And I got bitten by the bug, and I, I, the thing that I thought was a heater in the corner of the classroom turned out actually to be a, an early computer. And so I, I suddenly discovered how I love programming. And then when I got to university, um, and I started doing my PhD, I, I, I fell a, a little bit further, some would say a lot further, uh, and I became a software engineer, or at least I thought I became a software engineer. And for 20 years, I was doing research in what I thought was software engineering until actually, I discovered that there were much better software engineers in the programming languages community who'd actually made this transition from programming languages direct to practical, real-world, scalable software engineering at Facebook. And their story began with this paper. Um, this is the paper from Popol, this conference 10 years ago, 2009, by uh, Cristiano, Dino, Peter, and Hong Suk, um, all of whom I think will be here at some point this week. And this was the paper that really launched this company. The company was called Monoidix, and it's the company behind Infer, which I'm sure many of you have, have seen the news. There was a fantastic tutorial on this on Monday. And uh, this is the post that Byron Cook made about the acquisition in 2013 of Monoidix. And at the time, I, just, I was stunned by this. I thought, here's this group of programming languages people, but they're going to go and do software engineering at scale now. So, Monoidix was acquired by Facebook. Here are the, the happy four. It's B. Lavender, who is the CEO of the company, Peter, Dino, and Cristiano. And they then were able to make Infer not just a product which they could make a little bit of money out of as a startup, but through Facebook's approach to making all of its core infrastructure open source, they were able to deploy Infer to back to the research community, essentially. So Infer is now an open source product that's been designed to do scalable static analysis. And this, I thought, was, was fantastic, but it made me feel very, it, it was quite a, a chastening moment for me because there I was, professor of software engineering at a reasonable university, thinking I knew what I was talking about, discovering that actually I knew less about software engineering than people from the programming language community who just taken their courage in their hands and gone into industry and tried to deploy what they had. In particular, for me, the, the, the thing that we always talk about at software engineering conferences is this biggest challenge. We, we always ask, well, is what you're doing scalable? I think that's still not very visible. <laughs> we might, might need to pull the, can you see that all right? Yeah, yeah. Oh, you can. OK, it's just me then. still doesn't work, okay. It's not just you. <laughs> so the thing we often say in software engineering conferences is, well, you know, this is a great idea, but will it scale? And lots and lots of great ideas that don't scale don't really ever meet that kind of requirement that, that then makes them deployable. And one of the huge advantages of working in a company like Facebook is the scale really is the, the, the ultimate in, in the challenge of scalability. So there are 1.49 billion people using Facebook every day for communication, social media, building their communities. And actually, just to mention, there will be a special announcement from Facebook uh, on Thursday at the reception. Um, I would encourage you to go. There'll be an, uh, uh, an announcement that I think will be of interest to this community. Um, hope so. 
but from a software engineering point of view, it's not so much the number of users that's exciting, it's the fact that this scale means that we can test the things we're developing, the technologies and the tools and in particular the research ideas we have at scale. so what those numbers translate to in software engineering terms is there are over a million commits every day to the to the repository. sorry, over one hundred thousand per week, but there are over a million per day instructions given to them. and these figures are from i think about three years ago. so that's why i've put greater than. so you know, this is really the, the epitome of scale. at the time uh, of the monoidix acquisition, i was concerned with a very different kind of scale though. i was working on search-based software testing and i was excited that the academic community were taking a great interest in this. so the uh, the, the growth in publications roughly fitted aquatic, and I thought this was good scalability. Oh, that wasn't supposed to happen. Interesting. Okay. Thanks for that little interruption. Um, <laughs> so, so search-based software testing is, is the area I was working in, and this is really what I'm going to be talking about, how we deployed search-based testing through the acquisition of our company and then the subsequent growth of the Sapiens team. There is a, a research paper from 2015 that, um, oh wow, that um, covers the history of this area up to about 2015, as you'd expect. So, so if you're interested in the, the history of, what I'm, of this area, then you can read that paper. It's at ICST, which is a software testing conference. Essentially, the idea behind search-based software engineering is incredibly simple. It's really to take search-based optimization, which has been known since the uh, Second World War, and software engineering, which has been an area for approximately 50 years. We, we now attribute its uh, definition to Margaret Hamilton uh, from about 50 years ago uh, in 2018. And all search-based software engineering is, is the intersection of these two. So we take computational search techniques and we apply them to software engineering problems. I could spend a lot of time here talking about why this is the killer app for computational search, but I'd rather leave that to, to discussion later. So I, you could argue, isn't this just, you know, this computational search, just apply it to any engineering discipline. Why is it different to aeronautical engineering? Why is it different to computational search for chemical engineering? There is something special when we apply computational search to software engineering because the, the the material, the engineering material in which we're designing these, the systems is the same as the, the material with which we design the computational search. And that leads to all sorts of self-referential possibilities, which I'm sure this community can easily imagine. And that's what makes search-based software engineering special, in, in, my, uh, in my humble opinion. But it's, it's an area that's now starting to receive attention. And Peter was very generous and kind to mention that uh, I'm regarded as one of the founders of the field, but actually I just wanted to put this into context. I was very fortunate to have one of the early papers on the subject, but if we look at the history of this subject, at least the history of the idea of optimization in software engineering, it goes all the way back to 1842. So um, probably haven't got time for a full history lesson today, um, but can you guess who might be the person in 1842 who has something important to say about computational search? It is, of course, Ada Lovelace. So many people, when, when talking about her work, will, will cite examples from her, her notes on Mambre's a description of the analytical engine. It's wrong to call them notes. It's actually three times the size of the original paper. Uh, and the notes contain many, many more gems than the ones that are very popularly known. So the most well-known quote from Ada is the one about the, the analytical engine weaving algebraic equations in the same way the Jacquard loom, loom weaves leaves. With, with patterns like leaves. And that's something you'd expect, really, from, 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 the, from the daughter of a poet and a mathematician. But actually, I think that the most exciting and the one that really, that the quote from her paper that gives me goosebumps every time I read it is this one. So she says, one essential object is to choose that arrangement which shall tend to reduce to a minimum the necessary time for completing the calculation. Now, you've got to bear in mind how prescient this is, right? People often use Edison and the light bulb as a sort of a, as a, a sine qua non for inventivity. This was, this was before the light bulb. In fact, this was a full 10 years before Edison was born. In fact, electricity wasn't really very widespread at this point. This was written by candlelight, and of course, the, famously, the, the computation that was being envisaged here was going to be powered by steam. But here's someone who's understood that one of the most important things we're going to face 
in this discipline of software engineering is, is optimization of code. If we wind forward to uh, 1949, we have a very well-known paper by Alan Turing. I think many people in this community regard it as the advent of um, the idea of intermittent assertions in code. This is a four-page paper. So if ever you get your paper accepted as only a short paper, don't worry. This paper founded both the field of software testing and the field of software verification in four pages. We have to, so yes, both testing and verification. If we wind forward a little bit to 1962, a very interesting and important paper, this is the first time we see the idea that generating test data for software systems is a search problem in a random, in, in this case, it was a random search. And that was work done at IBM. And then the first time we see the idea that you can use optimization algorithms to help with software testing and verification in this case was, was James King's PhD. So that was the first advent. I, I'm aware of I, By the way, do challenge me on these historical claims. I, I, I find the best way to, uh, to get them right is to present them as if they're true. And then you guys can tell, tell me, oh, no, there was one before that. OK, and then I can, I can uh, correct myself. So, so then two papers appeared almost simultaneously that one used hill climbing and the other one um, used a similar computational search technique. And these are the first time we see people using what we, we now call metaheuristic algorithms. So algorithms that don't always give you the same answer, that every time you run them, they use some kind of blend of heuristics to try and search the search space for a solution. So that's back in the 1970s. And then in the 1990s, uh, Bogdan Carell introduced a very simple hill climb method still used today in many deployed search-based software testing techniques called the alternating variable method. This is an incredibly simple approach. You have a vector as your input to the system. You measure something like coverage, and then you permute the values of the input variables, and then see if you got closer to your testing goal. And so it's really just a hill climbing approach. But it, it's amazing how effective it is. Uh, more recent for than that, in 92, Santhakis et al. had this paper where they, they were the first to use a global search, so genetic algorithms. Right now, in this search area, genetic algorithms are the most widely used technique. I think the reasons for that are largely sociological and not scientific, but that's another thing I'll just leave out there and we can discuss if there are any, uh, any takers for that discussion. So this is the first use of genetic algorithms. And so, as you can see, before I was fortunate enough to coin the phrase search-based software engineering, there's been a lot of work on, on SBSE. And all I can really claim is that I, I said that this was something we should do for software engineering as a whole. So how does this then end up at Facebook? So the, the point, starting point for us is that our applications, like other applications, can exhibit field failures. So how many people have, have got a, a mobile phone? Either Android or, yeah, OK, I think everybody, right? Yeah. And how many people have experienced something like this on their phone at some point in its lifetime? Yeah, OK. So as a result, we test. Now, if you think about testing, how many people actually have done any testing in their career at some point, right? OK, now keep your hand up if this was something that you really, you know, when you got out of bed, you thought, I'm so excited to go to work today. I'm going to do some <laughs> testing. Right? This, is, this is like, yeah. Yeah? Oh, one or two. Good. Talk to me later. <laughs> so. Testing's kind of a masochistic exercise, and there are some masochists in our community, but if we think about testing, it, it's, it's slow, it's painful, it, it feels like drawing teeth sometimes, and it's not the most exciting thing, really, that we can, we can do with our lives. But for all these reasons, it therefore implicitly becomes regarded as unimportant until one day, suddenly, the system fails, and then it suddenly is urgent. So the current state of the art in, 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 in industry, in testing, is that engineers design tests. That's still boring, painful, and slow. But machines at least execute them. So the legwork is taken out of the process. And our idea is, well, why should engineers design tests? Why can't we use computational search to design tests? After all, tests simply live in this enormous search space. And that's what search-based software engineering is all about formulate the search base, find intelligent algorithms to search it, ways to represent the search problem, and then off you go. So what we do in the Sapiens team is we regard the app as a, a, at the system level. So our search is searching the space of interactions with the app to try and find crashes. Now, that, 
that's an important distinction that we'll we'll come back to. Most of the work in the scientific literature on search-based software testing is at the unit level, but we chose to work at the system level. There are a lot of disadvantages that come with that, but there was one big advantage that was what prompted us to do it. If you're interested in the scientific details behind Sapiens, there is a paper from ISTA 2016. Uh, ISTA is a conference on testing and analysis. Um, so there's that paper. That, that describes the search algorithms we use and so on. And Oh, I beg your pardon, that's a bit fast. And there's also a more recent paper from just this year that describes most of what I'm going to say now about how we deploy this technology at Facebook. So we deploy it into the continuous integration system. So there's a, there's a computational search algorithm at the heart, but in order to deploy this, we have to do all sorts of um, engineering scalability type issues. So at Facebook, we have this infrastructure called FB Learner, Facebook Machine Learning Infrastructure. And one of the nice things is it has a, a flow architecture, which allows us to define operators which can can execute concurrently, and uh, we can design pipelines like this. So, oh, I can't do that. Can I? Because you can. Yeah. Okay. So, <laughs> how do we do this? Okay. So, um, so we've got a recurring operator that will build the app, essentially run the search algorithms. If it finds a crash, it will then try and triage that crash. Uh, now, how does it triage a crash? So, this is a fault localization problem, which is also something that's been studied widely in the literature. And one of the interesting things we found was that. Because we were a research team, but trying to focus on deployment, every point at which we met an interesting new research problem, we had to be very disciplined and say, we're going to take the path that leads to fastest deployment and park all these interesting research questions we find along the way. The good news for the research community is that we deposited all those interesting research problems into that paper I just mentioned. Uh, and occasionally, Facebook has funding even offered to, to, to address challenges. So, um, but even if we didn't offer funding, I do think some of them are very interesting problems to, to tackle. Uh, and I'd, I'd, I'd love to talk to people if they're interested in, in tackling them. But one of the problems that we did have to tackle, we couldn't really park it, was how do we localize? And we used a, a simple-minded approach, which is take the stack trace, take all the diffs. Diffs are just based our word for commits into the repository, and then run simple rule-based approach that will identify the likely, the likely uh, line in the diff that caused the crash, and then put that back into the review system. So we've deployed computational search into the continuous integration system. And this was exactly following the infer model of deployment, which was also deployed in a similar manner. So I started off by saying what made me want to do this was the, was the challenge of scalability and the, the idea that we would, and I thought this would be our biggest challenge. How can we make this scale? That would be our biggest challenge. But actually, it turns out that scaling up your technology, so long as it's not you know, um, you know, exponential, or if the algorithms are basically linear or sublinear, then, then uh, actually even if they're polynomial in some circumstances, then, then they, they, they can scale because although we have a lot of engineers landing a lot of, whoops, that went a bit fast than I thought. We have a lot of engineers landing a lot of diffs, as I said, about 100,000. We also have a, a, essentially a cloud-based infrastructure called One World, which will provide us with as many emulators as we want. So at any given time, we're running hundreds of emulators on each of the apps to, to, to generate these, these test sequences. And we can, we can moderate. As we get more diffs, we can, we, can, we can stretch elastically the cloud. So scalability turned out not to be such a challenge. And this is what, what Sapiens looks like deployed at Facebook. Here's, here's a, a small part of that, uh, in, that, that set of emulators. And when we, when we run it to, to find tests, essentially it's, it's really just being like a user, exercising these apps, constructing these sequences of events, and then um, trying to breed better sequences from, from worse ones in order to try and find crashes. One problem we faced was the Oracle problem, which is how do we know what the correct behavior should be. So we, we adopted a very simple-minded approach, which is the implicit oracle. Essentially, the app shouldn't crash. An interesting avenue for research is automating better oracles. Now, one thing I mentioned was back in 1962, we had this uh, paper by Sauda, uh, the first ever deployment of something that we could call search-based software engineering practice was a random search. And that, indeed, that's exactly what we've deployed. So you might say, well, have you really made any progress since the 60s? Because the difference is what was a system in the 60s was very different. So the idea of, can you read, is that too small, that? 
Is it okay I'm getting thumbs up from back? Okay, so if we have a, a simple function like this, then a search-based approach, we treat that as a unit, call this the unit under test, and then from that we'll very easily abstract the idea that the, the vector that we're searching over is int cross int, and so we'll have a test input generator and conceptually, you can think of this as trying out different possible combinations. So it might, for example, initially try the tuple 12 by 17, feed that back into the unit under test. Well, that doesn't work, so it might try a different one. Nine, nine, nine. This is actually the alternating variable method. It'll realize that doesn't work, but also it'll measure the local distance at that predicate we're trying to cover there, x equals 42, and it'll adjust the inputs accordingly. And as it sees it's making progress, it'll finally get up to the magic input that makes it crash. And that's... That's essentially how unit-based, search-based testing works. Now, at this point, we might say we've designed this search-based testing system at the unit level, and we, we deploy it, and we say to the developer, hey, I found a crash. You know, I'm excited, you know, the bot. And what does the developer say, do you think? Great, thank you very much, bot, I'll go and fix it. No, the developer says, go away, this is a false positive, right? That'll never happen. Right? It'll never be called with 42. So this is the problem with unit-based testing. There's been lots of research that shows that you will uncover all sorts of issues, but a large proportion, a very large proportion, will be false positives. And so you'll just, if you deploy that, you'll just end up annoying the developers. So we had to drop 90% of the literature and work on more at the system level. So at the system level, the problem essentially seems similar, but it's actually different only because of the chaining of probabilities. So... At the system level, uh, there's a bug here in this code here, ultimate question, right? Famous bug, in fact. You might recognize it. So it, it should be returning 54, but it actually returns 42. And we're in base 10, not base 13, so that's the wrong answer. So this is now the system under test, and our task is not to find the values of that vector, which we can type and know, know exactly what kind of world we're in from a type theoretic point of view, but we've got to just have a sequence of events as our input, and we've got to find that sequence of events that's going to cause this return statement to be executed. Well, in order to do that, we're going to have to, first of all, find the input sequence that'll actually get us into the right piece of code to execute bar, then that's going to uh, have to make this predicate true. But as you can guess from that uh, constant there, this is a predicate that's very hard to make true. So that's, that's a challenge in itself. Now, that would be a challenge at the unit level, but a solvable one, because the search space is tractable. But at the system level, the chaining of all of these different probabilities starts to become quite a challenge. So it could be that the the green lines there, those are the ones which are going to automatically get, those branches will automatically be followed, but the red ones might be complicated chains of, of executions, each of which on their own is relatively improbable, but when we take them all together, um, oh, good, good heavens, where's that? Oh, well, I thought I had the, uh, the probability at the time. Anyone want to calculate the probability there? <laughs> Oh, it's at the bottom. Oh, yes. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. So, so that, you could say, now, now, interestingly, if we hadn't deployed at Facebook, the answer to this would be that's still a false positive. It's a pseudo-false positive because the chance of a real user experiencing this bug is very, very low. And... An interesting thing happens with false positives when you deploy in practice, which is if something doesn't happen in practice and your tool argues that it is something the developer should care about, then he or she won't care about it. And it won't matter whether you can prove to them that actually it can happen in practice if it doesn't. So whether you like it or not, you're forced into a probabilistic way of thinking. Um, I think um, Patrice Godfire has talked about this, about bugs which are... I can't remember the phrase he uses for it, but it's like correct enough. You know, it's, like it's, it's correct in the sense that it's not going to happen. So this probabilistic thinking in this situation might mean that, well, actually, this bug is as good as can't happen, and therefore reporting is a false positive. But of course, that probability multiplied by 2.1 billion is actually a non-trivial 
probability. and so what we found was we expected to have lots of these pseudo false positives and we would report to developers quite nervously, hey, you know, this can crash and the developers initially would say you know that will never happen. right? so for that to crash the the user would have to click this and then go to that screen within a tenth of a second and then click this and scroll down and click that. that's not going to happen and then a day later we'd say here's some real users who've We've experienced exactly that bug. So quite quickly, we discovered that actually we don't have too many pseudo false positives because of scale. So once again, scale here became our solution, not our problem. So actually, the thing that tells me how much time I've got has, has gone blank. <laughs> so I have no idea if I've overrun. Oh, great. I haven't overrun. Good. OK. So, so far, what I've talked about is how we've deployed search-based testing at Facebook. And the, the key decision we made there was that we should be at the system level, which means our search space is horrible. And it means that our search is, is at the moment, probably benefiting much, much more from random search than it is from, from any kind of clever optimization algorithms. But it has the big advantage that what we've deployed when we say there's a bug, there really is a bug. And so we have a very high fix rate, and developers really do take the signal from Sapiens seriously. And that, that was important as our first step of deployment. We can now, having achieved that kind of, that, that kind of um, what's the word, like launch pad, then we can use that to launch all sorts of exciting computational search. So the current state we're in after a couple of years at Facebook is we've got an infrastructure that will allow us to play with computational search algorithms. But our, our challenge is, how can you make computational search at the system level work as well as it would work at the unit level? And for that, we need to tackle some tricky problems. And that, that's where we're at in the, in the state of the test data generation. But I think what the organizers would love me to talk about and what Peter mentioned was this idea that we also have been recently playing with the idea of automatically fixing some of these bugs. So I'd like to spend five or 10 minutes telling you a little bit about that work uh, and then um, come to a conclusion and take some questions. So, Automatically fixing bugs is actually, at least for, if we don't set our goal of fixing all bugs, then fixing some bugs is, is a lot easier than it might seem. So we start off by finding a crash. So Sapiens finds a crash. And then we say, well, can we try and automatically fix that? So we trigger a, a patch generator. And there's been a lot of research since 2009 on automated repair in, in software engineering community and in this community too. Uh, so lots of things to choose from. But we had, once again, we couldn't really afford to be a research group. We wanted to focus on deploying this. There is a paper about this work to appear at ICSI, by the way, in, this, in, this, in the, um, what they call it, the industrial track. I think they call it software engineering industrial practice. So there is a, a full paper that describes all this. But the key thing we say in that paper is we didn't solve any new research problems. But what we did do is we managed to deploy for the first time, I think it's fair to say, some kind of automated research in practice at scale and therefore see how developers respond to that. And one, one interesting thing came out of that. So our approach uses four different ways of fixing the bug. And two of those are simply to essentially try and rub out the commit that causes the problem. Now, if you read, read the literature, how many people are familiar with the literature on repair? Can I just see a show of hands? Just so I know, vaguely familiar. OK, very few. OK, so you'll, you'll know this. but. The rest of you will have to take my, my, my word for it. If you read the literature, one of the things that emerged very quickly was the idea that if we use particularly computational search to fix bugs, because computational search is smart and will essentially find hidden corners in, in your search space that you didn't really expect, brilliant at finding corner cases, what will often happen is it will find clever ways of deleting the code that makes your bug manifest without actually really getting rid of the root cause problem. So a classic example of this would be, um, you introduce a commit, it causes a bug, I'll just revert the commit, right? And then I've fixed your bug, haven't I? Right? But that's not really what the programmer wanted. It's not really a fix. Well, actually, even that turns out to be hard at scale, because if you've got people committing changes every few seconds, and that's changing the code base all the time, then just if we, if we take an hour or two to discover there's a bug, and then we want to try and revert it, your commit may depend on her commit, and her commit may depend on his commit. And you know, before you know it, you can't actually just revert this without causing a cascading effect. So we have this idea of partial revert, where we try and find just those lines that we delete that would mask off this fault, but won't necessarily fix the root cause. Now, why on earth would we want to do that? That sounds bonkers, right? Why would, why would you? 
just mask a fault. And in the scientific literature, people have called it pretty much whatever the scientific work for bon bonkers is, right? They say, like, don't, don't do that. There have been papers published criticizing the whole idea of repair, saying, you know, it just masks faults. That's not really what we need. So it turns out it's exactly what we need right? in, in a very specific use case. So if I'm designing an automated testing system and I'm taking the latest version of the app and testing it continuously and you land a diff that makes the app continuously crash immediately, an insta crash, if I can't mask that, I can't test any of these other diffs that are all landing at the same time. So if I can't find a way to mask your crash, my testing is broken until such a time you fix your diff. And that might take a day or two. And for those two days, we're flying blind with no testing. So here is a use case that we wouldn't have discovered unless we really, well, we may have done if we thought a bit smarter about it, but certainly as a community, we hadn't discovered without trying to take the research, deploy it, and see what happens at practice. And one of the first things we bumped into was this idea that you do actually need to be able to mask faults. There is a very practical use case for it. So the existing repair technology, with all its faults and warts and wrinkles, is actually very useful and deployable. And so we deployed partial and full revert, but the more interesting research piece is that we also use templates harvested from developers using a, a technique called Getafix that was developed by my colleagues in Menlo Park, uh, led by Satish Chandra, who I think is here, uh, or certainly going to be here this week. Um, so they took the work on essentially saying, well, you know, developers land all sorts of fixes, so let's harvest all of those fixes and try and generalize templates. That's an interesting problem in itself. And those templates become fixes that we know developers like, and so they're likely to accept them. But sometimes the templates won't fit. You know, maybe you have a new bug you've not seen before, all sorts of reasons. So what we do there is we use simple mutation. You can think of this as a single generation search-based approach. It just tries mutations and then sees if they, if they fix the bug. So that then goes into um, a new revision. So we use all the existing infrastructure. We make, so SAP Fix is our fix technology. It just makes fixes as if it's another developer making, making its own uh, corrections. And then we have to validate them, of course, in some ways. Are these fixes any good? So we create a revision using SAP Fix. And that might actually generate multiple patches. Maybe the template approach produces one, two different mutation approaches. So we then feed those back into our testing approach. So first of all, they might not even build. OK, so if they don't build, then that's a, that's a non-starter. If they do build, then we can run Sapiens on them again, so we can automatically test them. And as Sapiens gets better, the fixing will get better, which is nice. So ultimately, we can target the lines we specifically changed. We can target the regression questions. But it's still just testing. So you know that would give a little bit of worry for this community, I think. So we're going to land these fixes that have only just been tested. Mm, not so good, but hey, guess what? All of, the other, all of the other things that landed into the code base were all just tested too. So until you guys develop a good verification technology that we can deploy, that's the state of the art, or at least it's the state of the practice. So we do run all of the E2E -E tests. So essentially a SAP fix is just as tested as a human commit. It's actually slightly more tested because we can target Sapiens at it, but it's still just tested. Our ultimate dream here is what we call FIFI verify. What we'd love to be able to do is find the bugs automatically using, say, something like computational search. Maybe using your favorite technique, we could use dynamic symbolic execution, but we find the bugs. Then we fix the bugs using a combination of templates, mutations, search. After all, the program is just another search space. So instead of searching for tests for a fixed program, why not search for programs for a fixed test suite? Right? In fact, why not co-evolve the two together? That's a talk for another day. But then ultimately, we want to verify, maybe using something like, um, like uh, regression verification. We want, so we, want to, we don't necessarily want to verify it's correct. We want to verify it's no worse than the original program we started with. So that's a much easier verification problem. So think about it. All these different pieces are there. They're, at, they're there in the literature, in the community. We, we know how to find bugs. Not all of them, but we can find a large number. We know how to fix bugs automatically. Not perfectly, but well enough to at least put it into a system that can then test. If we could also then do regression verification, we now have an end-to-end -end piece that can essentially take a buggy piece of code and produce a much more hard and better piece of code. Why not? This is what we call FIFI Verify. So what we've deployed right now isn't that. It's a step, a very modest step towards that. We haven't used any 
real verification in this approach. We have used some static analysis uh, as well as dynamic analysis, but we've essentially deployed a system that will find bugs, try and fix them, but its only guard against them not being fixed is testing them and then using that as a way to shield the developer from having to look at lots of obviously wrong fixes. So the developer will just look at the, um, the ones that get through all that automated process and then he or she will be the final gatekeeper as to whether those land into the code base. According to that, I've got 17 minutes. Is that right, till the break? That's not true. What's the time now? Okay, I'm going to finish any minute, so there'll be plenty of time for questions. So one last thing I wanted to mention. Um, if I've got time, I was going to mention about how we connect all this with Infer, but maybe there's no time. I don't know. I've got five minutes. Apparently, apparently I've got five minutes. That's good. So, <laughs> I've ten minutes. Okay. So <laughs> the author of Infer can warp time, right? <laughs> Seven and a half, okay. Was this newton raphson approximation? What's going on? <laughs> Optimizing. Okay. So one of the lovely things about working at, at Facebook um, is that not only is there a large testing effort at scale, but there's also a large static analysis effort. The Infer team live right in the same building as us. So now we have the possibility to play with what does it look like to combine static and dynamic analysis. And there are lots of ways we do this. So for example, if Infer finds an NPE, uh, an NPE, that doesn't mean it's going to be an NPE. It means like this is a possible fault. If Sapiens then finds a failure and it traces it back to that same line, we now have the possible fault and the likely failure and the connection between the two. When we report those to the developers, they have a 98% fix rate. So we've given the developer the initial evidence of the failure. So you're trying to prove a negative from the start, right? Because the signal disappears. Does that mean it's fixed? Okay, so you stop seeing the crash signal. It's worse than that. The crash signal is a signal of a failure. 
but the thing that causes the bug is a fault, and there's a complicated mapping between faults and failures that you don't know, but you can try and infer from various different failures. so you can try and cluster the failure signals and try and cluster them intelligently, speculate about the mapping between faults and failures. but also you've got the obvious knowledge of when when people have changed the code, but don't forget the code is also changing very fast as well. so so something you know you, you've got a rapidly changing code base, you're searching for the absence of a signal of failure to try and plausibly reason about whether a particular cause of that failure, and there might be multiple causes, whether they've, whether they've, whether they've gone. So detecting whether something is fixed automatically is, well, I mean, probably the underlying, I should think it's not easy, not difficult to prove the underlying problem's undecidable, but, but doing it practically at scale for a reasonable rate, reasonably pr uh, accurate fixed detection is still an interesting open challenge. We, we had to solve that one because we have to know how many are fixing. So we solved it in an approximate way uh, with you know, a, a simple finite state machine protocol for fixed detection. And that's published in the paper. But this is in itself a very interesting and exciting problem that connects static analysis, dynamic analysis, plausible reasoning. You could throw a bit of machine learning in there. There's probably some interesting problems for natural language processing. There's all sorts of very interesting technologies that could be brought to bear to try and tackle the problem of how do we know whether something is fixed? Uh, there are many, many other problems, um, automated oracles, the flaky test problem, you know, how we combine static and dynamic analysis, how we combine human design tests and machine ones. I haven't got time to talk about all of those. They are in the paper, and I'm very happy to take questions now and, and talk about some of those or other things that might be on your mind. Thank you very much indeed for, for listening. Thank you, Mark. So, um, so for questions, I, I neglected to say before, um, the, for the people following online, you can go to Slido, sli.do, and enter the tag popple2019. And I'll keep an eye. If you have any questions, people following online, then um, we'll get to those questions. Um, other than that, um, questions are open to the floor now. I should do this too. Thank you for the talk. Um, so to what extent have you managed to uh, save Facebook engineers for com from coming into work in the morning with the dreaded feeling that they had to write tests today? Is this something that is just added to uh, how testing work works in Facebook, or are engineers writing less tests nowadays? That's a very good question. So the question is, well, if automated testing can work, does that, essentially, underlying your question is, if automated testing can work, does that mean humans don't need to write tests anymore? And I think the answer to that question is no. Um, I think what, one, of the, one of the challenges we've got there is how to combine machine and, and test and human test hybrids. I think what happens whenever you automate anything is not that the human stops trying to solve the problem, but the human moves up the abstraction chain and tries to solve the more general problem of which this was an instance. So if you think about that in terms of testing, if we've automated all of the legwork of finding all the tricky corner cases, all of the, you know, we can, we, can, we can essentially suppose in some future world, not too far distant, we can, we can cover your app pretty reliably. And we can know that we've executed most of the paths and we've, in most of the interesting states and we've found most of the interesting corner cases. And not just for coverage, but for, for the battery life consumption, all the non-functional properties of interest. Now, suppose we're in that world. Now, what now becomes the role of the human in testing terms? Well, it seems to me that the role of the human now becomes to, to work more on what, what is the oracle. So testing now moves from being a problem of writing tests with the code in there to make the, code, make the program execute how you want and the oracle buried into that as some separate piece of code that I now run and I call it my test code. Instead of that, we don't need test code so much anymore. Maybe we still write some for some special uh, cases that machines aren't good at finding, but mostly we don't need that. What we now need to do is, is much more rigorously and systematically insert the oracle into the code itself. And, and this essentially means contract-based programming, intermittent assertions, all the things that this community has been talking about for probably three or four decades now, but that still don't happen enough in practice because there isn't enough, there isn't enough motivation for it. But, it but, but now if you have this world in which you can automatically explore the app very reliably, now it becomes worthwhile to not bother writing tests and put your Oracle code here, but put your Oracle code here in the, in, in the, in the system itself. 
Okay, um, Mark, we need to move. We've got a Sorry, lot of I'm questions. Sorry, I'm too long answering. We've got a lot of questions. Sorry, I hope that answered online. your question. If not, do come back. Okay, to me. we've got a lot of questions. I'll try coming. and be quicker. So, um, how does how does Sapfix compare to the developer actively trying to fix the bug? Sapfix essentially automates what developers do. At least it automates what I did when I was in boot camp. So I started off at Facebook, and I was like, oh, geez, man, I've got to fix these bugs. What do I do? I'll try this, see if it works. Right? So maybe that's a, it automates what a naive developer would do. So um, essentially what we're doing is we're trying to, all these things are just taking the legwork out. So we're taking the legwork out of debugging by automating that, that, those tedious things that a human would do. Try different things, rerun it, see if it works. Yeah. OK. Um, how long? For, End to end, from a buggy commit to an autofix. How long? That's a very take? good question. So in in the ICSI paper, we do a box plot of how long it takes from when we detect the bug to when we we suggest the fix to the developer, and I think the median time is 90 minutes, um, but there are some outliers. Um, so the the key for us there is it's got to be within the time frame that it would take a human reviewer to review that diff. So if I submit a diff, and then after the human reviewers have wasted time reviewing it, Sapiens comes in and says, hey, it's broken, and here's a fix. That's too late. Uh, and that 90-minute window is, is within that time frame. Yeah. OK. Have you any hope Hi, at uh, Facebook to autofix okay. serious bugs like privacy bugs? That's a very good question. So if you didn't hear it, so Patrick's question is, have we fixed any serious bugs like privacy bugs? And the answer is no. We've actually fixed only, guess which bug we went after? We, we, remember, deployment, focus, focus on the leading edge of that, that power law. What bug would we go after? Which, what would be the natural thing to go after for fixing? Anyone want to guess? Null pointer. Null pointer, yeah. Tony Hall called it the billion, the billion dollar bug. Right? But I think Patrick was, asked, is there any hope to go oh, Is there any this? hope? I beg your pardon, Patrick. Yeah. Um, is there any hope to fix those? Yeah, I, I, why not? <laughs> <laughs> what, do, what do you expect me to say, Patrick? Like, no, there's no hope. You know, there's always hope. <laughs> I'm sure abstract interpretation would help. <laughs> it really would. No, I believe that. I really believe that. In fact, I think abstract interpretation will help us a lot with, with automated fixing. Um, just, you know, it's, it's, it's a wide open door, yeah. Uh, hi. Uh, it's a question about the emulator. Does it capture performance related uh, characteristics like this battery life consumption? Very good question. So the question is, what about your emulators? Can they capture all these non-functional properties, you know, battery life and so on? And the answer is they can capture some performance, but not, but things like, but not all. And so we do actually have enormous great farms of real, real devices as well. And everything I've talked about today also is deployable on real devices. Right now, we're just going after crashes, so we haven't needed that. But it, it, there's no reason why in future we wouldn't do that. And indeed, the research prototype version of uh, Sapiens, which is available, by the way, as uh, open source, um, does run on real devices. I can ask an online. There's a lot of good online questions, by the way. So, how much of this work transfers? It's moving. There's too many questions. How much of this work transfers from black box to white box testing? And I don't know why this is related. Could Google deploy this on the Play Store? Uh, okay, good question. Two, two questions there. Um, so the first question is, how much of this black box, how much white box? Actually, when we launched the, the, the startup company, uh, Magica, our idea was to be black box, because our goal was we have to be able to get into a room with our potential users and find bugs in half an hour. Otherwise, we're out of the door. So we didn't want to assume any knowledge at all about the app. We just get the APK file, and we have to find crashes. So that's why implicit Oracle, pretty much random search, do it at the system level so the crashes are actually real things that they can't argue with, and keep it black box. Now we're in a different world, because now we're inside Facebook, and we, there's no reason to be black box anymore. So yes, in fact, one of our big challenges right now that we're, we're, we're tackling right this minute is how do we scale things that you think are easily solved problems, like, like fine-grained coverage? You know, fine-grained branch coverage at scale, unobtrusively, so that it won't interfere with those non-functional properties we were just talking about, like execution time and battery life. That, that, that's one of our current challenges, so that we can make this much more white box. And that's the key to unlocking that, that interplay between um, system-level testing but still getting the advantages of unit level. Yeah, and the second question was something about should Google use this on the Play Store? Could they? Could they? Yeah, they could, yeah. Thank you for the interesting talk, Mark. Uh, in the Venn diagram toward the beginning of your talk, when you were uh, uh, illustrating uh, uh, search-based software testing, you seemed to hint that there was some interesting 
incestuous relationship between it was being software under test that was being optimized by code that was an algorithm written as a piece of software. but you didn't say anything in the rest of the talk about that. could you say a little bit about that? sure. yeah. a very good question. thanks. so it's very generous of you to call my two bubbles a venn diagram, by the way. but yes. so there's two bubbles that came together with sbse in the middle um the venn diagram. the idea there is the the challenge i set myself was, well, why isn't this just search-based x, you know, where x could be substituted by any engineering discipline? why is software special? and the answer, i think, i did actually write a paper at etaps about this. i gave a keynote in 2010 at etaps, and there's a paper that goes with it called why, so i can't remember the title, but something why search-based software engineering or whatever. and the key observation there is that suppose you're designing engines. so boeing has used genetic algorithms to design engines. so what do you have to do? first thing you have to do is you have to model the engine. so you need to do some physics, right? so you make a, a, a physical model of something in the real world. now you need to build a simulation of that model. and now you can use fitness functions defined and executed and computed in that fitness function to search the simulation of the model of reality for good engine designs. good. that's great. But notice how many layers of indirection there were there. You are not finding engines. You're not, but you can't, you, I mean, conceptually, you could just mock up an engine, right, and then evaluate its fitness, but that's far too expensive. The cost of evaluating fitness on the real engineering artifact for a Boeing engine is astronomical. The cost for evaluating fitness for a test case in the real system under test is minuscule. So now, our fitness function is computed not on an abstraction of a simulation of a model of reality. It's computed directly in reality. In fact, the search-based code could be deployed as part of the deployed software and continue to be optimizing and refining the code as it executes in the deployed scenario. That can't work for any physical engineering discipline. You can't, at least I hope not. I'd be rather scared if I look out in the wing and I see the, the engine reshaping as I do and the captain says, oh, we just deployed a new genetic algorithm today. and we're gonna... That's not going to happen, right? at least not any time soon. Okay. So, um, so the answer is, is the fitness function is computed directly on the engineering material because the engineering material is software. And that makes a fundamental difference to what we can do. I think we have time, Mark, for two more questions. I'll take one online. If somebody wants to ask a question from the audience, okay. this one will come after mine. OK. So um, isn't the argument that low probability problems can be ignored problematic in the face of adversaries trying to break security. Say again, sorry? Isn't the problem the argument that low probability problems can be ignored problematic for security? Yes, and I didn't say they could be ignored. Oh, okay. I just said that they might be counted by some organizations as pseudo false positives, but that we definitely wouldn't regard them as such. Cool. Just to put the record straight. Is the record straight? Yes, I think so. Cool. Probably, final question. Hi. Uh, you mentioned that the techniques can be easily scaled as long as they are linear or sublinear. And for this community, that's a kind of, I don't know how many linear or sublinear techniques there are. So uh, is there hope for all of us? Or <laughs> Yeah, most of your techniques, I gather, can be made linear or sublinear with a little bit of abstract interpretation. No, I'm sorry, yeah. Did I mention abstract interpretation? Yeah, no. I, I understand that, the ch that that might seem a challenge. I, I also did say that in some situations, polynomial is OK. But if you're exponential, well, you are going to have to partner with a software engineer to work out how to make that practical. If that's. We are you're happy with decidable. <laughs> Funnily enough, in our world, we're happy with undecidable. <laughs> okay. Um, so the. We've got some extra questions online. I'll, I'll see if Mark will take those questions separately later. Perhaps you can deal with those questions. Um, but other than that, Mark, thanks for an inspiring Thank talk. Thanks very much. For